Good morning, everybody. I am James Shore, and this is the Art of Agile Development Book Club. Uh, today, we're discussing visual planning, and I'm thrilled to have Jeff Patton and Goiko Adsik joining us. Uh, Jeff Patton is founder and principal of Jeff Patton and Associates. He's best known as the author of the best-selling O'Reilly book, User Story Mapping, which describes a simple, holistic approach to using stories in agile development without losing sight of the big picture. Jeff is deeply involved in teaching and speaking in the agile user experience and product management communities. Jeff, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. And Goiko Adzik is a partner at Nuri Consulting LLP. His book, Specification by Example, won the Jolt Award for the best book of 2012. Another of his books, Impact Mapping, introduced the world to impact mapping, one of the visual planning techniques included in the art of agile development. Goiko is a frequent speaker at software development conferences and one of the authors of MindMap and Narakeet. Goiko, thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I'm so glad that, to have the two of you here. Um, to get us started, I'm going to read an excerpt from the Art of Agile Development. As a reminder, the second edition is out now in both ebook and print editions. You can get it from Amazon by visiting jamesshore.com slash s slash buy aoad2, or you can find excerpts and bonus material by visiting jamesshore.com slash s slash aoad2. Visual planning. We have a map for achieving our purpose. Your plan is the key to achieving your team's purpose. Rather than saying, do this, then this, then that, create a plan that allows you to visualize your choices and adapt your plans as you go. Visual planning is how you do so. The possibilities for visual planning are endless. Here, I discuss four techniques. You can follow one of these techniques as written, mix and match between them, or create new visualizations that are wholly your own. The right visualization is the one that works for your team and its stakeholders. Who plans? Visual planning is led by team members with product management skills, with the assistance of the teams, with the assistance of the team's other on-site customers. Do your best to include key stakeholders too, at least for high-level planning, and look for opportunities to include real customers. Their perspectives will improve the quality of your plans. Developers can be heavily involved or not as your team sees fit. Some developers prefer not to attend yet another meeting, and in truth, their time might be spent, may be better spent elsewhere. On the other hand, developers' work will benefit from an in-depth uh, understanding of the plan, and their perspective often leads to better plans. I tend to leave it up to each individual developer to decide. Even if developers don't attend, they still need to understand the plan and provide feedback. Be sure to set aside time to discuss the plan with developers. The planning game might be a good time to do so. So that is uh, the beginning of the material on visual planning in the art of agile development. Uh, two of the topic, two of the techniques that are included in that book, of course, are uh, story mapping and impact mapping. And we have Jeff and Goiko here who created those two techniques. I'm so happy to have the two of you here because uh, they're just fantastic techniques. And I love the way that, that uh, you approach this from, from more than just the simple list that you see from tools, or even the simple grid that a lot of people put on their whiteboards when they use whiteboards. Throw something in before we start. Absolutely, um, go ahead. Yeah, so you, you said I created impact mapping, I did not. And it's it's very important for people to know that. And I, I keep correcting people to, to, to no end about that. Impact mapping was created by Ingrid Dominguez in, in uh, Sweden, uh, working for a design agency called InUse. I, mm. I just wrote a book about it. I, I, I found it incredibly useful and thought it's a shame more people don't know about this uh, and, and kind of all the credit goes to, to them. Um, I, there was no creative part on, on my end there. Oh, well, thanks for, thanks for letting me know. Uh, I first heard about it from you. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Jim, I'm uh, tromping on you, but yeah, I took a class from them years ago and they went in, again, bad, bad Swedish translations, they refer to it as effect mapping. And it was very, very UX centric. What you've done, Goiko, is turn it into something that lets us uh, expose options a bit better. You've popularized a technique far beyond what they did. And the, uh, there's some mutations. And same is true for me with story mapping. Uh, the, the idea of lining up cards left to right to tell a story is not a, a new invention. Um, uh, I didn't even coin the term. I thought I coined the term story mapping until someone pointed out to me that screenplay authors have been. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We're having a little technical glitch, but uh, we're going to bring this on back. Okay. I think that was caused by me getting boring. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, do you want to finish your thought, Jeff? Oh, I don't know if it's, yeah, just, it is interesting that it seems like there's no new techniques. Uh, both Goiko and I popularized uh, some practices that have been around there and, and we get some credit for that, but man, uh, yeah, no, there's no, it seems like there's no inventions. <laughs> um, that, and, that, I'd say that's absolutely true, but uh, I do think, and I have your book around here somewhere too, Jeff. Um, I do think that this book that you wrote, Goiko, and the work that you've both done on your respective uh, popularizations uh, is is important and valuable. So regardless of where the ideas originally came from, because I think you can trace every idea back to basically the invention of the wheel, um, regardless of where it came from, I am very happy to have you here talking about it today. Of course. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with our first discussion prompt. And again, uh, this is a call-in show. Uh, so if you have any thoughts, uh, anybody in, in the audience, if you have thoughts, just use Zoom to raise your hand. And uh, I'd love to love to call you up and, and have you share your thoughts or ask questions of our guests. So our first discussion prompt is, um, is about uh, visual planning, of course. Visual planning techniques are a way of visualizing your options rather than presenting a simple to-do list. And uh, of course, Goiko and Jeff, your, your techniques are both highly visual, but what are the benefits of doing this as opposed to a simple to-do list? And what are you giving up in exchange? for doing that. And I'd love to hear from either of you and from the folks in the audience. Okay, you wanna start or I'll jump Yeah, in. okay, I can, I can start. So one yes. of the things that I get personally from visualizing options is um, replanning becomes easier. I, I, I kind of um, like to look at the roadmap as, as a map of multiple options, multiple roads. And if you look at say Google Maps or something like that, it, it's a true roadmap in a sense that there's more roads there that, than you will ever, ever, ever take. But knowing that these roads exist gives you an easy way to replan if one of the streets is blocked. And visualizing multiple options it works the same way like that. We have more work than we, we plan to actually implement. So if one idea turns out to be bad, it's not the end of the world. We'll just do something else. And being able to kind of present that in a way that avoids a strong commitment on these are the 50 things we're going to do this month or uh, in this particular sequence helps people focus on achieving uh, some value or some objective rather than um, kind of punching user stories out and, and, and punching story points out. It helps people solve a problem instead of delivering a solution. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things I really appreciate about your approach to impact mapping is that um, it really emphasizes the option, the idea that this is a choice, a, se a set of choices that we can that we can choose from. How about you, Jeff? What's your take on this? Uh, it, working, it, it, uh, you know, I think you might be talking to the wrong people with Goiko and I. I don't think both of us. I don't know another way to work other than working visually or spatially. Uh, the if, if you're working with Look, I've been, I'm old in the agile stuff back when we did we used to write stories on cards and the, the advantage to writing stories on cards is I can lay a bunch out on the tabletop and you can, if you've got cards or sticky notes or something, anything you can move around spatially, it's easy to indicate that things are similar by putting them close together and dissimilar by moving them farther apart or slightly more important by moving these slightly up or down. And uh, there's so many things you can communicate with by moving things around spatially that you can't with a list or any other conventional means. Uh, part of your question, Jim, was what do you lose by doing that? I, the, I, there's, a, I, there's a class of people that get anxious by working that way or mm. uh, that sort of want the uh, precision or the uh, um, certainty of having a prioritized list uh, or the, the idea that something is certainly more important than another thing or something, something that certain, something certainly happens before another thing. Uh, uh, I think there are people for whom options aren't comfortable. Yeah, yeah, that's that's been my experience as well. What about you, Goiko? Do you see that uh, as your your approach is even, I think, even more freeform than Jeff's is in terms of presenting a lot of different options? Um, do you see people get anxious about that? Uh, yeah, and and kind of it's so funny. Um, kind of, I I used to do a lot of consulting work with big banks, and uh, you have people kind of uh, in development teams who, who, who like to think about options and, and things like that, then you have people 
between them and, and the true business people that are insisting that the business people would never uh, accept anything like that. And then you have the true business people that are investment bankers and traders. Their entire business is about kind of figuring out options and, and, and hedging <laughs> and, and things like that. And it's, it's, I've, I've never really understood how the people in the middle uh, in these organizations don't really get that um, the, the whole business is set up about risk and risk management and, and options and hedging and kind of figuring out one strategy that works and milking that and, and, and things like that. And, and it's usually, yes, those, those, those kind of people somewhere in the middle um, seem to be <laughs> creating all That's the problems good, yes. with software development. It's not what this is supposed to be about, Jim. This is visual planning, but that's one of the challenges we've all got is that obfuscation layer in between what we do and uh, the the people who benefit from it. Uh, yeah. The, problem. The, the, the idea of Scrum of a, the product owner, which I think was well-intentioned when it was created, but in practice has turned into this sort of project management layer that stands between a team and its real customers. Um is something that I've seen over and over cause problems. When I actually talk to those, those real stakeholders, those actual customers, I see that they usually are pretty open to interesting ways of thinking about the work and they really appreciate the idea of options. But the project management is all about dates and what, what when, and, and, what, and what deadline. And they're not as interested in, uh, in coming up with options in my experience. So I think yeah, that, that kind of, that, that level is people managing effort, not people managing outcomes. Yeah. And, and that's the problem. And, and Jeff has this wonderful slide I, I stole from him where he talks about yeah. outcome over output. And, um, you know, fi figuring out really how to focus on the outcomes is, is uh, I think, one of the key challenges of, of uh, product development, whatever type of product it is, and especially important for software, because we, we're so disconnected from real physical stuff. It's moving bits and bytes around. And, um, you know, we, we can spend millions and millions of any currency on doing something that people claim is valuable, but it's actually not. Uh, and, and that's the problem. One, one consistent thing, and I see, I, Andy, I see your hand up, but uh, now I'm going to riff off of what Koiko just said. Uh, if we're planning, we're talking about things to do or options, but one consistent thing uh, is what appears in both of our methods is not what our options are, but why, what we're driving towards, what our goal is in effect map, or <laughs> effect mapping. I'm sorry, I, I still had it in my head. In impact mapping, the impact is front and center and the, the people can, that can affect that impact are a uh, secondary layer. And neither of these are things to do. Uh, 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 I'll define output is what we build, outcome is what your customers and users do in order to get value, and impact is the value that ultimately comes, uh, comes from using the product that we build. If you're doing story mapping right, you're mapping in outcomes, you're mapping in what customers and users do, so it keeps that visible. Uh, uh, and then we can make choices about what we're going to build to afford them to do. Uh, the uh, one characteristic I think of good visual planning is keeping the why visible. Why are we doing this? Uh, who? What? What benefit are we getting from doing this? And with list, you kind of lose that. You just it's a it's a long, it's a list of what's what we could do, and the why is hidden, uh, obscure. Yeah. I think in, in your book, Jeff, you talk about uh, having this beautiful understanding of what's going to have and then chopping it up into little tiny pieces and throwing it on the floor yeah, and, yeah. and having it all mixed up. Let's, let's give Andy a chance to uh, come up and share his thoughts. Andy, uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, so uh, a lot of what I was going to say has kind of already been said, but I think like chopping those things up into the little bits kind of makes people uncomfortable. Like presenting those different options can make like the different entities uncomfortable that I've worked with from an engineering perspective. And, you know, like especially when it comes to like actually showing the differences between the outcomes, like the outputs and the impacts. So a lot of people kind of get in the mindset that I've worked with of just showing the movement and that I've seen. So rather than the actual, you know, outcomes or impact. There's a, there's a wonderful uh, statement in Doug Hubbard's book on, on business metrics, where he talks about how um, people usually shy away from things that are difficult to measure. 
And, yeah. and they try to use proxies that are easier to measure. And one of the easiest things to measure and one of the easiest things to control is effort. And that's why a lot of the stuff our industry tends to do is focused around tracking effort, measuring effort, and um, kind of designing for effectively effort. And, and that's where he, he, all, all these, you know, uh, pompous CVs where it says successfully delivered a 5 million project on time and budget. That's all talking about effort. And, yeah. and it's really, uh, so, so I think historically we've had this thing as an industry where people have learned how to measure and control effort. And it's very easy for them to do that now. And, and that's why we're doing kind of these pieces of work and, and we're treating our stuff as pieces of work because that's effort we can control and manage instead of um, kind of looking at the value, which tends to be kind of relatively tricky to, to measure and, and prove. Yeah, that is, that is a great point, Goiko. Um, Matthias uh, has a comment. Uh, Matthias, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry, too many Zoom things popping up telling me whether I'm with it or not. Um, it just, I, I was going to, I just want to real quick, um, that last train of thought, I think there's also a big component that there's a much higher risk of failure with outcomes, right? Out, you can control output, you can always get a team to crank out more widgets, um, but but outcomes are often out of the control of the team because it really depends on how people react to it. And so I think in a lot of organizations, it's far safer for people to to focus on, on output and measuring their success with that. Um, I wanted to, one thing that impact mapping for me has been incredibly valuable with is, is when I work with business users, um, that when you show all these options, um, you can show that it's not all about IT. Um, it, it's your system is not going to save you. Uh, I recently made a created an impact map with a customer and we ended up highlighting the things that the IT system could contribute, you know, in changing. And it was like four stickies on the entire map. And it really made it clear for them that like, this is primarily your issue. You need to change your processes. You need to train your people. You need to do all these things. And they had this tendency to just throw everything over the wall and like, IT, solve our problem. And then of course they could complain about it if IT didn't solve all of their problems. So there was a little bit of that, um, but it was just a great way of visualizing how much responsibility they really have for the outcomes. And, and I love impact maps for that. So thank you so much for that, for that tool. Um, it's been fantastically useful. So how, how did they react when you when you showed them this and they they saw that there was so little that IT could actually do? Uh, were they comfortable with it? Not necessarily, but we were lucky enough that the particular business person we worked with sort of got it. So so you know it, I think it was more for him to take it back to his stakeholders where some of the difficulty was going to be. Um, but it emphasized the need to just work on this together. And they were running a pilot where they hadn't actually built anything, which was already fantastic in and of itself, right? They just changed the process and manual and measured the outcomes. Um, so we, we, we were kind of dealing with someone who was open to the message. I've had other mm -hmm. customers where they really don't like it um, because it's just far more convenient if you can tell IT that it's now become their problem. Um, mm -hmm. But we got lucky on this one. Thanks for your comments. I'm going to switch gears for a moment. Uh, well, switch gears to a, another topic, which is about how do we get the most out of visual planning? So what sort of skills do people need to really get the most out of visual planning and how can they develop those skills? And uh, Jeff, I think I'll start with you this time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> or we can hand uh, off to Goiko if you'd rather. Yeah, no, no, no. I'll say, uh, you, uh, what sort of skills? It, it, the, the, my head immediately goes to, we do this collaboratively and people suck at collaboration. Uh, most people think collaboration is arguing until you get your way or uh, some variation of that. Uh, uh, one of the things I'll teach is how to work together effectively. And when you're, so one true thing about working with visual planning tools, it's, uh, is that you lean heavily on the visualization to do the communication and a lot less on your words, a lot less on what you're saying. Moving things around visually communicates faster than you could possibly explain things. So uh, uh, developing or building skills for collaborating with visual tools, that's not something that everybody's got. Uh, uh, tools are uh, straight up are a, a thing. Uh, it, before COVID, tools meant um, whiteboards, uh, sticky notes meant uh, other things like that. Post-COVID, uh, visual planning tools have got to be 
mural or mural or tools that uh, allow us to move things around visually. So building skills in those things, that, that's, that's a thing. Koiko, what else? Um, so no, I think pattern matching is always a good good uh, skill to have, especially kind of when you, people visualize things. Because one of the things visualizations help me a lot is spot patterns and, and spot things that like, like second order things that might not necessarily be implied in the words. And, and kind of that's that's where the, the images are interesting. I um, w- one of the things I really love using story maps for is to figure out is the bulk of the work going to be on the things that are really important? Um, if, you, if you lay out a user journey or a, a backbone of a story map, and for this particular persona, I don't know, this part of the user journey is really, really important. And then you step back and see that, well, the bulk of our work is kind of somewhere after that or before that, just looking at the number of stickies. Then, you know, are we really investing the time we should be investing where we're investing it? Are we are we focusing on, on where we need to focus and kind of figuring out these visual patterns and, and kind of hidden messages in the visualizations uh, ends up being really, really important. And that's why I think figuring out uh, a, a way to evolve a vocabulary of, of these visual things is really kind of critical. I think story maps are much, much better for that than impact maps because impact maps really have just this hierarchical dimension where with story maps, you can have the shape of stickies, the color of the stickies, the uh, size, the, the, the kind of visual clustering or grouping, and, and you can show there are seven or eight dimensions of a plan in the same visualization. And then look at these patterns, and that's really, really important, I think. You know, maybe I suspect people listening here understand the relationship between those two things. If look, okay, I'll kind of sharply define outcome as what, customers and users do in order to get value. We, we produce output, customer and user, users do something, and the, the, the effect of them doing something is business impact. You know, uh, uh, customers don't want to, uh, customers don't want to increase revenue. It's their buying or using a product that increases revenue. Customers don't want to, or users don't want to reduce cost as they're using a software that makes them more efficient that reduces cost. We've got to agree on that impact to start with and look down for options. And once we've got an impact and the options in mind, those options, again, the only way we get business impact is by somebody doing something. And the story map makes you think through what those people are doing. And uh, when you start slicing a story map, you're kind of keeping that impact in mind. There's a relationship between these two tools. Uh, There's not a one or the other. It's a one, then the other often. Uh, And sometimes people will start with a map and then have to go back up and say, why are we doing this? Or why do these people need to do this? And then you've got to back into the impact that you're shooting for. Anyway, uh, two different aspects that we're looking at. And that's another annoying thing about visual planning tools. (laughs) So (laughs) there's no one that does it, I suspect. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jim has a comment. Uh, Jim, welcome to the show. Oh, very good. Just had to get unmuted. Thanks, Jim. Um, so your question was about skills, and I think skills are are very important. Uh, before we get to the skills, though, um, you might have the people with the skills and not have the right people. So I think mm-hmm. you know, number one, it's getting the right people in the room, mm-hmm. and I'm talking about people that have uh, knowledge and imagination. Um, you know, that are appropriate to the domain. So uh, fundamentally, I think one of the questions is how do we get the right people in the room? Um, you know, we can have uh, people help with facilitation with around the collaboration and all of that, and we can build up those skills. But fundamentally, if you don't have the, the right people in the room, I think we're going we're gonna to be um, a non-starter, really. Um, you know, Let me jump skill in on side, that. I'm because I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think figuring that out, I, that is actually one of the types of skills yeah. that I was imagining. Yeah. I was going to jump on that yeah, too. Exactly, Our exactly. Who should be involved is a skill. That, that's yeah. right. That's and getting right. them so, in the room is, is a real skill because well, it's, it absolutely. can be hard to get the right people in the room. Yeah, so it's it's kind of like, you know, open space technology where you you know put up a theme and then you're, you're, you're looking for the right people to arrive to have the, the conversation to solve, you know, challenging problems. So getting the right people in the room, uh, having 
those individuals be able to imagine possibilities. So I think one of the skills is, is that ability to imagine the future, mm -hmm. um, all the various permutations of that. And I think often we ignore some of the richest sources of information. I mean, the actual customers themselves, uh, we sometimes ignore sources like our customer support group, you know, the people that are in the trenches, uh, you know, helping people deal with their real world problems and using their existing solution, and which might actually be the solution we provided to them. Um, so, so getting the right people in the room, having the uh, ability to imagine and, and come up with various permutations of possible futures, um, using the visualization techniques to kind of map that out, um, as opposed to putting it into some sort of prioritized queue. I, I really strong fan of keeping you know, these options open and being able to see those. Um, anytime I look at a map, I, I, I tend to, you know, when I'm thinking of a trip, um, I, I'm often doing some optimization. And it's not necessarily the fastest way to get from point A to point B. It might be the, you know, the journey that takes me to the most interesting places. So I think uh, in addition to all the, you know, all the permutations, we need to have some people in the room that are good at kind of optimizing, you know, for the journey for the, for the outcomes that we're seeking from that journey. Um, and, you know, kind of meta to this is the, the idea of the organization having the right organizational design and also the organizational processes that enable the right people to get to the right place at the right time to do the right thing. Um, you know, a lot of times we build up structures and, and processes that, that don't facilitate that movement of, of people to, to the right place. So, and yeah, the thing that kind of comes to my mind is, is open space technology and using, you know, that kind of approach and that kind of vote with your feet. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, concepts to get the right people in the room. When I read your comment, Jim, on the, on the developers, you know, they, they could choose to join or, or not to join, you know, I thought that was beautiful. And you know, how often do we see instances where it's mandated, you know, that, you know, it's an all hands, you know, everybody has to be here. And, you know, it seems to be counter to what we're actually seeking is to get the right people, you know, in, in the room and, and give people that, that autonomy, that self-management, that self-organization. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your comments, Jim. I think you inspired a thought in Sarah. So Sarah, welcome. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say in, in answer to what kind of skills, um, I, I think one of the important skills, at least um, in my experience doing these kind of things has been just the ability to, to kind of break down the problem um, first as a, as a way towards driving towards a solution. So um, it, one of the things that interested me about the chapter is referring to it as visual planning. And I, these, uh, activities. I've, I've, I had never thought of them purely as a planning exercise. To me, it's, it's a, a lot of it is about getting that shared understanding of the problem itself, working together to kind of under, like break down the pieces of, of our problem space, uh, look at alternative solutions, look at all the different options. And then like the plan is kind of the tail end of the, of that kind of that dialogue. Um, and, and it, and it honestly, you know, obviously the plan that you are planning at, at some point not, but to me, there's so much value in, in, in that, um, breaking it again, breaking those th things down into pieces, understanding, you know, this step below, uh, in this process is really part of this bigger, uh, story, um, as opposed to on a, you know, once that gets to a backlog and you're seeing something as like a, a small activity you lose that, that, that shared understanding of, of where that is. And I think people, when in, to the point about skills, I think that it's one of the hardest things that, that people struggle with is, is really um, with, with problem solving and, and doing these things is breaking this, breaking things down into small pieces. So every one of these is a, provides a way to do that. That still kind of gives a bigger visual picture of how, how these, how these pieces relate. Absolutely. Yeah. Jeff, did you want to say something? Oh, yeah, lots of things bubbling. Uh, <laughs> I saw some body language from you. Uh, well, yeah, this, no, no, this, no, there's, sure. there's sort of a shared theme here of getting the right people in the room and communication and understanding. Uh, what's your take on that? Um, uh, I, uh, in the story mapping book, I uh, beat the drum about shared understanding. That's our heads are in sync. And the most retweeted phrase from the story mapping book is shared documents aren't shared understanding. Mm problem we have with any plan or anything we build is reading it doesn't communicate it effectively, uh, especially when you're looking at something spatial. It takes humans and story telling stories around the, the map to, to do that. Um, yes, yeah, so shared understanding is a big thing. It takes collaboration to get that. Uh, 
so that's a thing. And then uh, what Sarah was saying about it, it is interesting, the relationship of big things to little things. We, we've got people that are doing things, creating software, and a lot of people are content to do things without understanding why they're doing things or where they fit into the big picture. Uh, uh, but uh, it, one of the skills is understanding that what I'm doing is a small thing that uh rolls together with some other small things that roll into a big thing that results in some, ultimately some benefits, some impact. Yeah, I'm just thinking, uh, <laughs> no, no uh, good coherent thoughts there, just pat piling on. No, that's that's great. Um, I'm gonna give Sarah a chance to respond to that. Sarah, go ahead. I just wanted to add one more thing that we talked about the plan as an outcome, but um, um, I, I also try to use start that same shared understanding of that leads into the plan though, is a good way to kind of have identified some of the, um, some of the nouns and the verbs that help drive actual like design then um, technical design that they get the shared understanding with the engineers. So I know we're saying, you know, the engineers um, may or may not need to be in the room, but I do think that once you have that kind of picture like with the story map of the, of those things and how they're broken on that way, it really helps to shape that next step where you are taking it towards technical solutioning um, in a way that um, I feel like that's a good starting art artifact, if you will, like as a, as a visual picture to drive into the next kind of shared understanding of technical design. So it, 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 just a meta thought I've written down is uh, one of the things that's quirky for me is design and plan are synonyms. Uh, <laughs> it, it, if you look at the definition of plan, it'll give you a, a design in the definition. You look at the definition of design, it'll give you plan in the, in the definition. Uh, it's weird how one morphs into the other. You, you can't, I don't know. I, I don't know where the edges of those two things are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jim wants to follow up. Jim, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, so I, I kind of have a question. Um, you know, I'm thinking of this visualization, and when we talk about the ma you know mapping, often you know maps have varying degrees of detail in them, and depending on what your purpose is of using the map, you would use a map with you know different layers or different different detail. And so, thinking of telling a story is you know again back to having the right people in the room. You know, you have to have a storyteller. You have to have somebody who can actually tell the story of of what's going on. Um, when when we're expressing that story, it's like, what's the right appropriate or the appropriate level of detail, the right layer of the map to look at? I, I kind of think back to you know a starting point I often use with teams when we come together, just to do that uh, you know that shared understanding bit that Jeff was referring to. Um, very simple, quick exercises to do like a product box with them. You know, do we under do we agree on who the target customer is? You know, do we do we understand what their job to be done is? Do we understand how our product fits into that job to be done? Um, what are the compelling reasons? You know, for why you know our customer would buy this particular thing? You know, it's 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 a visualization of this, and it allows people to get their hands on ideally some physical artifact or or virtual. You can use the virtual whiteboard to do the same sort of exercise. But what I think is most powerful, you know, in all of these, regardless of the level of detail, is what Jeff was referring to. Is is basically a lot of these techniques reveal um, all these different possibilities, and some of those possibilities are aligned with uh, you know better outcomes. And by visualizing it, we we get it out of our heads and into a, a form that's relatively easy to consume. I mean, I can read a novel and, and get a story, but it takes a long time. You, know, you show me a picture and, and you know, visually I can, cons I can consume that more, more rapidly and I can get a better idea of if you draw a picture and I draw a picture and I can compare the two of them and I, I can see pretty quick rapidly the differences between the two, two different pictures and realize we're really not on the same page. So I'm, I'm curious about, you know, you know, the level of, of detail. And when we talk about these techniques, how, how quickly would uh, we want to jump into, you know, some of these more um, perhaps detailed planning techniques or design techniques, um, as opposed to doing something simpler at a higher level. Mm -hmm. It's a lot, it's the, uh, you know, to support that a lot of people don't have the patience for backing up. Uh, they want to move forward to what do I need to do tomorrow? Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people have a hard time backing up and considering the big picture. Uh, uh, there's a not my job sort of uh, mindset at some point where, you know, it's, it's my job to get something written here. Just tell me what to get done. Anyway, but yeah, the big picture helps. Not everybody wants to. 
there's a question that Matthias had in the chat uh, that people are backing up. Jim, did you see that? Do I need to jump? I, I did. We're we're almost out of time though, and I wanted to I wanted to switch gears and also give uh, Goiko a chance to to chime in. Um, there's this idea of using the the plans for visualization. Um, uh, w- wanted to wrap up with just. I think these techniques are most powerful when you when you customize them to your situation and to the people you have in the room. So I was wondering uh, how you'd seen them customized or how you've seen people approach or or come up with new ways of visualizing. And I wanted to toss that one to you first, Goiko, if, if uh, you have So I, I think that. that's one of the things I mentioned where the, the best story maps have seen people come up with their own visual dictionary of what different things mean. Mm -hmm. what different colors mean, what different sizes mean, what... So, you know, Jeff's kind of story map basically dictates there's this dimension and this dimension, but everything else is up to you. Right, And um, kind of coming up with... (laughs) Sorry? People hate that about it. They they want more... Okay, but I I love love that about it. I love that about it, of course. Go on, go, go, sorry. And so so coming up with your own visual dictionary and and, and kind of terminology, effectively, a visual language of, of... where things go. I think with, with impact maps, um, I, I've not seen people customize them that much, kind of it's breaking it down into more and more hierarchies. And this is maybe what Jim was talking about, different levels of detail, because impact maps are kind of hierarchical. You can package and package and package and, and fold and unfold and, and go up and down and, and maybe kind of doing different levels of that stuff. But what I've seen on impact maps that people really struggle with and, and um, this research I've been doing with Christian Hassa on how people use impact maps actually to get value points to um, lots of stuff that people kind of want to put on a map, but there's no space on it. Like we want to do this, but it has to be privacy compliant or, or we want to do this, but we don't want to damage our brand or, or the things. So these kind of overarching constraints and just kind of finding some place to stick it in using mm-hmm. a list of bullets under the goal or on the on the impact map or creating a box and then putting these ideas and constraints and, and everything else that doesn't fit on a map is really important because um, the, 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 we don't want to lose these important aspects of, of the conversation. We want to visualize them somehow. Yeah. And kind of, you know, creating cross-links, creating the different... Um, arrows and, and things that is also important. There's a risk of getting too much value to different syntax options. You know, one, of the most pow- one of the most popular goal-driven requirements engineering techniques, I, it's, it's, it's a mouthful to say that, in the academia is something called I-star, the Latin letter I with an asterisk. The basic book about I-star is this thick. It's about 700 pages or very thick documentation on what a 45 degree slanted line means, what a double edged line means, what three arrows means, what, what an arrow with like a, a, a um, full arrowhead or an arrow with an empty arrowhead means. And when you get into that much syntax, it's just difficult to, to figure out what the, the idea is because of so much kind of visual language. So I think there's, there's a balance that needs to be struck um, where the visual language cannot really get in in, um, in the way of communicating ideas. And there's a tendency for people to kind of do that as well. Um, so I think customizing the visual language and, and, and making sure that, you know, I don't know, the thick line means something, a thin line means something else. Uh, the green means something, yellow means something else is really important that you can use that with almost any visual planning technique to show these different dimensions of a plan. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are just about a time, out of time, and this may not be fair, Jeff, but I think this does tie in with the question that came in the chat about how do you deal, how do you visualize a lot of different processes or flows? We've only got a, a minute left. Okay. Do you have uh, a, do you have any ideas go, on that, Jeff, how you've seen that people customize okay, for those go. sorts of things? I'll pile onto what Goiko said in that the most exciting maps I see are the ones that people mixed up a lot of colors. They've annotated, they've drawn circles and lines and point back to things. They put stuff all around the outside edges and point to things. Those are better communicating tools. Uh, I love it when people start to have their way with the medium. And then somebody asked, how do you deal with branching? Uh, 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 I'll say, well, okay, tell, tell me about uh, 
tell me about what users are doing or tell me about, about what's going here. And I'll say, well, they, they do this, then this, and then there's a decision to make. And if they make this decision, then they'll do that and that. But if they make the other decision, they'll do the other thing and the other thing. Uh, and then I'll flatten it out. I'll say uh, this, this, that, that, other thing, other thing. And they'll say, well, why did you flatten it out that way? And I said, I just put it in the order you told me. Uh, I'll, I will put story maps in the order that people tell me the story and then where the decision goes, okay, that's the extra annotation. Uh, well, uh, and if you really want to show the decision, show a flow chart or show a uh, proper business model, something like that. Uh, the, uh, for me, the I, I try to keep the story map flat because I'm dealing with a bucket load of options under the big things, and I'm using that vertical dimension to prioritize or consider some of those. And if you uh, it, uh, if, you, if you take that away, then uh, you're just building a, a regular business model, which isn't a bad thing if you're trying to communicate uh, 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 trying to communicate how people do things. But uh, you lose that options dimension. That's the vertical dimension. Yeah. So cust just sense. customize it and and communicate about uh, about about what you're doing. Um, I I think we could keep on talking about this for another couple oh, yeah. of hours, but yeah. unfortunately, that is all the time we have. Um, Goiko, Jeff. Thank you very much for attending today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Goiko is partner at Nuri Consulting LLP and one of the authors of MindMap and uh, Narakeet. And Jeff is founder and principal of Jeff Patton and Associates and author of the best-selling book, uh, User Story Mapping. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, I am on vacation next week, so our next session is going to be April 1st, and we have G. Pa Hill and J.B. Rainsberger, join, Rainsberger joining us for a discussion of test-driven development, one of my very favorite topics. Uh, so mark your calendars for that. April 1st, 8 a.m. Pacific uh, should be a great conversation. That is it for this time. Thank you very much, everyone, and I will see you on April 1st. <laughs>